I've probably had much more lows than I've had highs. What makes me sad hearing that is, that's like your prime, 19 yeah. to 25. Yeah. Hi, I'm Rob Moore and welcome to The Disruptive Entrepreneur. So in this exclusive interview, we have the greatest snooker player of all time, Ronnie O'Sullivan. He really opens up about his life, about his depression, and about his snooker legacy. So if you want more disruptive interviews like this, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on the notification bell. So I understand from our research that you have struggled when you were younger with a bit of depression. So first off, is that true? And then if it is, how did you beat the demons? I always call it snooker depression um, and when I was younger, um, I used to just love the game and obviously I'd get down on myself if I didn't play well. Um, but then I think when I got to about 18, 17, 18, I kind of started to, to get a lot of doubt and started to compare myself to say someone like John Higgins. And I used to look at John Higgins and think, I wish I could play snooker like him, you know, he's just like the perfect player. He had everything, great temperament, great technique, great scoring, great safety and I thought, how am I going to stay with this guy for the next like 30, 30 years? You know, this geezer's an animal on a snooker table. You know, we all knew how good John Higgins was when he was 14. And, um, you know, and I always had the dream that I wanted to be like Steve Davis. I wanted to be this like serial winner of like multiple world championships. And I thought, this isn't going to happen because I've got John Higgins in my way. <laughs> 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 Can someone just get rid of him, please? Make my life a lot easier. Yeah. Um, but that wasn't going to happen. So I kind of had to like improve, if you like. You know, the game that I come in as a professional wasn't good enough to, to sustain it over long periods of time. So in a way, although people go, oh, you make the game look easy, it was really hard for me because I was playing like machines. You know, every time I come up to someone, they would just put, it's like playing Chelsea, they, they'd park the bus, they wouldn't attack, they'd, they'd set traps for me. I would always go for it, leave them in, and they'd go, you know, he's a great player and talented, but you know, he gives you chances. And I was like, and it wasn't until I started working with like Ray Reard and, and, and people like that, that, um, that I started to change my game. And I've had to develop as a snooker player over years. And, and with that development came a much stronger belief. So I, I would start to win matches that I would usually, usually lose. So like when I said to you, come Thursday, I'm not playing well, I'm out of here. But when I started to work with Ray Reardon and then learn the defensive side of the game, I started to win them matches. So now I'm, I'm getting through this game first. I'm still here Friday. And, and then I started to win a lot more tournaments. And, um, but it's like I had to learn another side of the game, which I didn't really, I would never have appreciated because I just didn't know how to play that defensive game, you know. Uh, and John Higgins did. So he, he was more gifted as a, you know he was at the complete pro even at 14 um, me I was just a potter um, but just being a potter isn't enough to, to, to dom dominate your sport no matter how good a potter you are because mm. some days they just don't go in yeah. <laughs> you know and, yes. uh, and then what do you do then do you, do you go okay it's not my day or do you find a, another way of kind of getting the job done and, and that was that's kind of been a hallmark of my career really is just trying to become a better match player, um, not 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 a better player, just a better match player, and, and learning how to to hustle it out sometimes, you know. So, are you saying? Let me see if I can get this right. That your the depression that you experienced was if you didn't play well or comparing yourself to other people. Um, it, it, would that be a fair? Hundred percent. Yeah. Hundred percent. Because like all, all I had ever done was snooker, you know, and that's all I ever wanted to be. You know, I looked up at Steve Davis and I analysed how he played. I analysed how he hit the ball, the noise, the sound it made, the angle it come off, why he could soft stun a ball in, and so I was kept very like um, obsessive about. You know, I never. I, I used to watch someone play, and I think the only reason why he's getting that ball in there and that white round is because of how. He's, he's, his Q action is, you know, and I know I've done interviews talking about Q actions, everyone thought I was taking the mickey, but really, the better the Q action you got, the more options you've got on the table. So, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're hitting that spot and you're in the zone and you're finding that slot regular, it's, it's actually a really easy game. But one day you wake up and you're not in the slot and you just think, you know, you start to panic a bit, you know, because the other guy might be in his zone and you think, well, hold on, I'm playing like, I'm not on it, but he is, I'm gonna to lose today. So you kind of start to panic a bit. And I think you, you kind of, um, 
And that's when the, the, the kind of negative depression sort of thoughts come in and you start to, to doubt yourself, you start to overanalyze, you start to overthink stuff. And I think over the years, I've had to learn to not overanalyze, to not overthink, to just trust myself, to kind of just forget that I've just played a bad shot or had a bad game and just kind of just get, get back on the bike and just accept that, you know, snooker, I'm never going to be able to be perfect to snooker, but what I can do is, is I can kind of forget what's gone on in the past and, and just kind of just get, get back on the bike and start, you know, one shot at a time sort of thing, you know? Yeah. And you're right talking about your career low? Yeah, my career low, because um, I've had so many. I've probably had m much more lows than I've had um, highs. It's only because because I think with the highs you kind of you kind of get into a rhythm of it and you kind of take it for granted. You know that you're in a good place, and it's like you know, yeah, you kind of like like I say, you you trained in a way whereas it just sort of becomes like getting out of bed, brushing your teeth, da 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 and it kind of like it all falls into place. Whereas my lows were just, they were like really dark sort of places and I, and I just remember having like a continuous six years of a dark place. Yeah, 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 I had a continuous five, say five years from the age of 20, 19 to 24. It was pretty dark um, and then I had a little spell from 2008, 2009 to 2011, where they were pretty bad moments. Um, and I just think probably the lowest I felt, the lowest I felt was, I think, I think what, I, probably around just before, yeah, about 1996, I put on a lot of weight um, and and I, th I just heard someone say, is that the fat one or the slim one? And I knew it was me, I was the fat one. And I just kind of, I've, I've always wanted, you know, I've always prided myself of having a, a bit of self-respect. And then I kind of like, when you hear someone say that about you, you kind of think, really, is that, they're talking about me there. And I kind of like, again, it kind of fueled me to kind of get myself fit. So within five months, I'd gone from 16 stone to 12 stone. I was training three times a day, but that was probably the lowest, period of my life, um, the lowest period on the table was probably in 2000, 2006, I think, when I walked out against Stephen Hendry. I wasn't enjoying my snooker then. I had a lot of off the table personal things going on and I, and I never really enjoyed playing. Um, and that moment when I walked out of him, I just couldn't take being out there. I didn't like my life. I was very unhappy. Um, yeah, and being under that sort of scrutiny, if you like, um, I just couldn't handle it. And then, and I walked out against Stephen Hendry, and uh, but then again, you know, that was that was a lesson. I got punished for that, and I just thought, well, don't do that again. And I kind of had to deal with my personal life in a way, so it forced me to kind of a little bit like with the drinking drugs. I had to go to the priory. I had to deal with it. Couldn't continue playing snooker like that. And the personal issues that I'd gone on in my life in 2006. I couldn't carry on playing snooker and have them issues going on off the table. So it forced me to deal with that because I wanted to play snooker. That was my job. That's what I do. That's, 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 that's something I never wanted taken away from me. So, yeah, that was probably my lowest sort of time in my, my life on the table. If you enjoyed this, if you want more, make sure you like the video. Subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell. And remember, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything.